L-E, Indian Lake. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Tuesday, August 1st. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Governor Hochland Attorney General Tish James announced new targeted steps to address the roots of gun violence. We've been to too many hospitals. We've been at too many crime scenes. We've buried too many black and brown boys, particularly boys. The number one cause of death for black boys is homicide. Also on the show... We look at housing across the North Country. Home prices and rents have risen dramatically in the last few years. It's a crisis because if people can't afford to live here year-round, it's hard to maintain thriving communities and schools. But the housing crunch also has led to a lot of new development of small, affordable, and attainable housing projects across the region. We'll hear more coming up. And we'll hear about a group using art to address housing insecurity. It's nice to be able to use art as a way to draw people in, hear their stories, hear their dreams about what housing is, and then get them started thinking about how they can bring those dreams to life. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Adirondack Foundation and the Adirondack Birth to Three Alliance, dedicated to providing all children the best possible start in life, adirondackbt3.org. And by Long Run Wealth, an SEC-registered investment advisor in Lake Placid, providing comprehensive wealth management, retirement, and financial planning solutions, longrunwealth.com. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Akwesasne Mohawk police say they found the body of the Akwesasne man who went missing in March when the bodies of eight migrants were found in the St. Lawrence River. 30-year-old Casey Oaks's body was found on July 3rd near Ross Island, about a dozen miles downriver from Akwesasne Mohawk territory. Oaks was last seen on March 29th boarding a small boat on Cornwall Island. Police started a search the next day. They didn't find Oaks at the time, but they discovered the bodies of eight people who they believed had been trying to make their way across the frigid river into the U.S. Four were from a Romanian family. Four were from a fa- were a family from India. Police are still investigating the deaths of Oaks and the eight migrants. The Syracuse Catholic Diocese will pay $100 million to hundreds of survivors of sexual abuse as part of a bankruptcy case from 2020. Their survivors' attorneys called the settlement monumental, but also said full accountability still has not been achieved. WAER's Natasha Sinyanovich has the story. Attorney Taylor Stipple calls the historic settlement a victory for all survivors of sex abuse especially those who, like her Syracuse clients, endured decades of silence and pain. Some were assaulted or raped half a century ago when they were four or five. Stipple thinks they deserve more justice, though, than a bankruptcy court can give. The opportunity to have their day in court was ripped from their hands with this bankruptcy filing. And that's why we think the tactic is so nefarious, because it robs survivors of what the legislature gave them the right to do. But Syracuse Bishop Douglas Lucia says court cases take years. And given the vast number of claims, he says filing for bankruptcy assured that his diocese could pay out all of the survivors. There's the danger, really, that you would run out of funds, that literally, as some places have done, you would have to close up shop. The the first few who might come and have their cases litigated would get something. But what happens to the rest? The $100 million comes from the diocese and its affiliates. It's the second largest settlement in the nation in this kind of case, which is not over. Next is trying to get the diocese's insurers to also pay out the claims, says Lucia. He hopes the fact that his diocese is working with the survivors will encourage insurers to step up. Attorney Stipple, however, is only cautiously optimistic. She says typically in these cases, only religious institutions have been making financial reparations. These insurers across the board have uh, employed tactics to delay, to deny survivors uh, the, the true value of their claims. 
And I, I would not say that any of them has been um, collaborative. Stibble says the $100 million settlement will not be split equally among the survivors, but based on legal distribution protocols. In Syracuse, I'm Natasha Sinyanovich for North Country Public Radio. Governor Kathy Hochul was in New York City yesterday. She, Mayor, Mayor Eric Adams, and State Attorney General Tish James announced new targeted steps to address the roots of gun violence. Karen DeWitt reports. Mayor Adams says the nearly half a billion dollar plan known as a blueprint for community safety will pour resources into New York City communities and neighborhoods that are most affected by gun violence. It includes over $118 million for early intervention efforts to prevent young people from turning to gun violence and over $50 million to upgrade substandard public housing conditions, improve parks, and create safer public spaces, as well as help New Yorkers in need better access public benefits. There are also funds for mental health resources and for improving police community relations. We're making a historical step that I believe is going to cascade throughout the entire country. Uh, With this new blueprint for community safety, uh, we're not just talking about it, we're spending about it also. Governor Kathy Hochul, who attended the announcement, says the state will contribute $30 million to the effort, including $6 million to help the city beef up its gun violence prevention task force. The other funds will go toward expanding summer youth employment to a year-round program. Hochul says she hopes New York City's program can be a model for other cities in the state to follow. The governor says she and the mayor present a united front to combat gun violence. Hochul took a veiled shot at her predecessor, former Governor Andrew Cuomo, who famously feuded with former New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. And letting the people know that the era of the governor and the mayor fighting each other is over, that we're going to fight for the people of New York. State Attorney General Tish James also spoke. She says the effects of gun violence are unequal and incidents are much more prevalent in black and brown neighborhoods. We've been to too many hospitals. We've been at too many crime scenes. We've buried too many black and brown boys, particularly boys. The number one cause of death for black boys is homicide. The number one cause. Mayor Adams says despite the uptick in gun-related crimes in recent years, New York's overall crime rate is low compared to the rest of the nation. Sometimes those random acts of violence like we witnessed over the weekend, it sort of takes away from the correct narrative. New York City is the safest big city in America. But others who spoke, including New York City public advocate and former candidate for governor Jumani Williams, say that number means nothing to those who lost a loved one to gun violence. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. An important state highway in Hamilton County is back open. State Route 28N, which connects Long Lake and Newcomb, was closed for almost three weeks after devastating flood damaged the roadway and a bridge over Fishing Brook. According to Governor Kathy Hochul's office, the original bridge is beyond repair. State and local crews have installed a temporary steel panel bridge that will stay up until a permanent replacement is built. For now, the roadway will be limited to a sing- to single lane traffic controlled by temporary signal lights. Later this summer, the temporary bridge over Fishing Brook will be moved, which will allow for two lanes of traffic and the construction of a new bridge. As repairs on State Route 28N continue, the governor advises drivers to be cautious while driving in the area. This afternoon, the Governor and St. Lawrence County Fair will open its gates. The fair is one of the largest in the North Country and runs through Sunday. Attractions include fairway rides, 4-H and FFA shows, livestock competitions, and live music. Country singer Dylan Scott will perform on Saturday and the demolition derby is on Sunday. Admission to the fair is free. The Franklin County Fair opens on Friday and runs through next weekend. The skies should be as clear as you head outside this afternoon and evening, so you should be able to see a full sturgeon supermoon. Supermoons occur when the moon is full during its closest closest orbits to the Earth that makes it appear especially large and bright. In August, we'll have two supermoons this month. A blue supermoon is coming on August 30th.
listening to Northern Lights here on North Country Public Radio. It's 10 minutes past 8. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, paper, fabric, and creative dream houses in Saranac Lake. That conversation in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. This is Dan Duggan on the Dulcimer. Music by Dan Duggan and Peggy Lynn can be found on our website anytime. Check out the underscore project at ncpr.org slash underscore. And you can join them for a couple of concerts this week. Uh, Tomorrow night, 7 p.m., there'll be a Big Moose Chapel, Dan Duggan and Peggy Lynn. And then on August 4th, Friday night, 8 o'clock, Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs with Jam Crackers. That's Dan Duggan, Peggy Lynn, and Dan Bergman. Also, you can live stream that performance, cafelena.org. So tomorrow night, Big Moose Chapel, and then Friday night, Cafe Lena. Northern Light is supported by St. Lawrence Health, offering MyCare, a way for patients to access health information and stay connected to their care team. Registration is available at stlawrencehealthsystem.org. Across the North Country, home prices and rents have risen dramatically in the last few years. And that's led to a widespread housing crunch. But it's also led to a lot of new development of small, affordable, and attainable housing projects across the region. They're driven not by developers that are trying to turn a profit, but by local towns, villages, and municipalities. That's according to Lori Bellingham, the vice president of community impact at the Adirondack Foundation, which has been funding and gathering information about affordable housing. Amy Feierisel spoke with Bellingham about the housing crisis, community will, and this this explosion of smaller housing solutions. We talk a lot on the radio and in the media, but also just in conversation about how the Adirondacks and the North Country in general is in a housing crisis. You know, can you define that for me? What does that mean? In a nutshell, it means that the region's housing stock doesn't come close to meeting the needs of all the people who live here or who want to live here, right? Either because it's unaffordable, it's unsuitable, or simply doesn't exist. It's a crisis because if people can't afford to live here year-round, it's hard to maintain thriving communities and schools. It affects every other aspect of our economy and really challenges our entire social fabric from the staffing of volunteer first responders to the ability of businesses to hire employees. There's a recent survey by the Lake Champlain Lake George Regional Planning Board and it shared that we need 20,000 housing interventions, meaning that there's that many people currently, including seniors, that are living in overcrowded, substandard housing or living well over an hour from their workplace. So something unique about your position is you're sort of keeping track of a lot of these affordable and attainable housing projects that have been coming online in the last couple of years. So can you just talk about roughly how many of those exist and are underway? So it's a great question and it's changed every week. So six months or a year ago, I probably could have put a number on it. What I know now is that there are dozens of communities whose municipal governments are serious about helping to increase housing stock for their workforce, that's a change. And it takes community will at this point. So everyone is pulling together, community members, municipalities, builders, rural preservation corps, and now land banks to bring together their resources to create unique partnerships in every community. So talking about those collaborations, that's really getting at, like, how do you make these projects happen, right? And, and, and how do you get them funded? Can, can you tell me, you know, how, how are these affordable housing projects getting funded? What you're referring to is often called the capital stack, right? How do you actually fund uh, these projects from beginning to end? And it varies from project to project. And it often depends on the project size, 
But the elements that are involved is, you know, philanthropy in the form of donations to nonprofits involved in housing, so including donations of viable property, private investment or loans at lower rates than may be available commercially, municipal investment, as I mentioned, such as taking on uh, or sharing the infrastructure costs and uh, various types of agreements that might defer taxes, for instance, on a project. Community will is really part of the investment. Uh, The community has to be behind and assist with solutions that keep their towns and villages and hamlets viable. There's public incentives, but there's very few public incentives that work at the small scale that pro- of projects that are necessary in, in the Adirondack region. Often we're looking at four to six homes or apartments because that makes a difference, right, in our school system, for instance. But there's really only two public programs that operate on that smaller scale. Mm, okay. Uh, and, and I want to zero in on those smaller scale projects, the four to six new housing units that you were describing. And those are the ones that um, sort of are being done through collaboration and often on a very uh, local level, a municipality, a town, a village. Can you describe a few of those projects? Sure. There's very small projects, uh, one of which is employer driven, which is, has been leveraging grants in order to renovate a handful of units for their season, seasonal workforce. So there's organizations that are building, frankly, specifically for their workforce. There's also a project in Keene. So when I talked about collaboration, really interesting. Uh, Both Meadow has been a community collaboration between the town of Keene, the Housing Assistance Program of Essex County, the Community Housing Trust, the Little Peaks Preschool, and local philanthropy. That'll probably result in four single-family homes. So my last question is, you know, for you, having been in this world, you know, working in housing um, and seeing these projects happening for a few years now, you know, what models do you think are good ones moving forward for other places to replicate? When I do look across at models that are happening across the North Country, models that are working, that are create actually creating housing units, they're mostly collaborations partnerships that are coming together to solve this challenge of affordability, right? It's the affordability gap that they struggle to address, right? And, and I, my numbers may not be perfectly up to date, but over the winter, at least, you know, builders were saying the need is to build at $300 a square foot and sell at $200 a square foot. So somehow partnerships have to come together and it needs to include philanthropy, public dollars, private dollars to address that affordability gap so that our workforce can get into these houses. That was Lori Bellingham, the Vice President of Community Impact at the Adirondack Foundation. She was talking with NCPR's Amy Feierisel about the smaller affordable housing projects that have been cropping up across the Adirondacks, many of which are collaborations between local governments, developers, and nonprofits. And coming up after the break, we'll hear about a group in Saranac Lake using art to talk about housing insecurity and cooperative housing solutions in the region. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, using housing-inspired art to shed light on the issue of affordable housing. That's coming up in just a minute. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note, the multiple functions of urban ecosystems. That's just ahead at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Weather service says a mix of sun and clouds today, mostly clear tonight. Highs around 70, winds light and variable. Lows near 50 tonight, a little cooler in the Adirondacks overnight. And then tomorrow, partly to mostly sunny. Highs in the 70s, a chance of rain Thursday and Friday. 
with highs in the low to mid-70s. And at this point, partly cloudy skies on Saturday and Sunday. Right now, partly cloudy, 55 degrees in Canton. In an effort to promote affordable and sustainable housing alternatives for aspiring homeowners and the local workforce, the Adirondack North Country Association, the Cooperative Development Institute, and arts groups invited community members to participate in an art project that explores housing, housing insecurity, and cooperative housing solutions for the North Country. Over the last several months, organizers have used the visual arts, stories, and poetry to engage the community on issues related to housing, houses, and homelessness. Recent housing needs assessments show an ongoing need for workforce and affordable level housing units in the Adirondacks. As part of the project, families gathered last fall at ADK Art Rise in Saranac Lake to use cardboard, crayons, and hot glue to design and build scale models of their dream homes. Some of the folks at the workshop are members of a local committee exploring cooperative housing in the region. Others stop by to show support for friends, colleagues, and family members struggling with finding places to live. Our Todd Bon has more. If we glue a chimney on like this, it's going to stand out sideways. Is that okay, or do you want to make it stand up straight? That's Brittany Sternberg, co-owner of ADK Art Rise. It's an art education space in downtown Saranac Lake. Tables have been laid out with tools, supplies, and lots of craft materials like fabric, paper, and yarn. She and her daughter are putting some final touches on their cardboard house, complete with a sidewalk and front lawn. Child's play? Well, sort of, agrees Sternberg. But it's also sparking ideas and conversations about what's possible in terms of more affordable housing. It's nice to be able to use art as a way to draw people in, hear their stories, hear their dreams about what housing is, and then get them started thinking about how they can bring those dreams to life. Why did you decide here at Art Rise to get involved? Well, me personally, um, I have a house that I love. My younger brother could not find housing in this area, and so he had to move away. And um, every day I feel like... My daughter's growing up without her cousins here, and that's a relationship that I that she's missing out on. Mm. So I'm sad that you know my family had to be split apart in that way. So I, I feel like I am fortunate in my small nuclear family, but um, I know that not everybody in this area is that fortunate. At another table, Martha Spear and her young friend Taika are at work. Martha is sketching ideas, and Taika is using paper straws, yarn, and cardboard tubes to build what she calls her monster house. So what is the idea here with a monster house? There's a party going inside, and he's like, ah. and that's and his this, tongue. Well, oh, that's his tongue. Okay. Yeah. Tell me why you two decided to come here today. Because we really enjoy each other's company, and Taika's extremely creative, as is her sister, Monica. And we love ADK Art Rise as a place to make stuff. And you have something here, if I can peek at your sketchbook. (laughs) Martha's dreams for a house. Tell me about that. (laughs) (laughs) Chickens. We must have chickens and flowers and garlic and tomatoes and a bay window and a wood stove and... You can go round and round the wood stove. What does your house look right now? Look like right now? I live in an apartment, and it's not distinguished in any way. <laughs> this is Liz Cooper, who Hi, runs Liz. Anka. My name is Elizabeth Cooper, and I'm the executive director at Anka. And Anka is doing the cooperative housing project, and we're doing it here today with Art Rise to sort of promote the project. As far as the art, it is, you know, kind of easy to put together, right? Some scraps, and and we can have it again. So we hope to take the houses that we, you know, had from today's workshop and bring them over to Lake Placid and Mm -hmm. hitting many of the areas, even up in sort of Plattsburgh or Messina, because that's where a lot of the people who work in Lake Placid live. They can't afford to live in Lake Placid. It doesn't exist. So it's very important that, you know, Saranac Lake and... Plattsburgh, Messina, some of the surrounding areas um, get involved and realize this project's going on. For example, one of our directors has moved four times, and she's been with us for a little over two and a half years. That's a lot, but it's because she had unstable housing, you know. 
Liz Cooper finishes her fabric-lined dream house while her husband Chris and daughter Adeline work on an underground house with moss on the roof. It's early afternoon and the art space attracts more visitors. I love the carpeting already on the floor. We want to make sure it's cozy. Yeah. Comfortable yeah. housing. My name's Vanessa Pillen. Where do you folks live? We're here in Saranac Lake. Why would you bring your family here today? Well, uh, just the idea of doing something that's artistic uh, and collaborative to solve a bigger problem, yeah. I think is a really important thing to teach our kids. Um, and we're, we have a friend from school that we met to do that too. So I feel like these young minds probably think outside the box more than I ever could. And so having a hands-on project that they can do together and it can be the first step to thinking of how can this solve a bigger problem on our hands. Amid the glitter and glue, there is chatter about affordable apartments, tiny houses, and an approach not yet fully developed in the Adirondacks, cooperative housing. Danny Delaney is ANCA's Entrepreneurial Economy Program Director. You know, a lot of the times when housing development is developed, um, it's developed from sort of a top-down approach where there's like an architect or folks that have like decided what this would look like, X, Y, Z. You know, there is that level of creativity in designing that space themselves. So we're excited for people to sort of start thinking about it in that way. Like, what can they bring to the table and see come to fruition? You know, even though they might not be architects themselves or know how to build it, they they have a vision for what they want to live in and who they want to, you know, what they want their community to look like. One of the first people that did theirs this morning, he he put on solar panels. Like, he was in fourth grade. Like, that was the first thing he thought of. Can you imagine? It's just beautiful. Cooperative housing is also on the mind of Audrey Schwartzberg, communications officer for ANCA. She and her teenage daughter are planning two houses, one for each generation, smallish with a shared space for gardening and recreation. She's hoping their housing-inspired art project will offer some hope on the issue of affordable housing. It's a, it's a chronic issue and it continues to be an issue. We see a lot of people come and go because they can't find housing. You know, a lot of professionals looking for ho- housing and um, and even when we moved here, it was just it was kind of luck that we found our house and it and it is a bit of a dream house. We feel really lucky that we have it, but um, it's only getting harder. You know, that was 9 years ago that we purchased our house. Um, We need some creative solutions. We need a lot of folks working on this problem, which is is happening. It's a systemic problem. It's not, and it's not just here. It's kind of nationwide. (laughs) Sebastian uses a saw and some basic carpentry skills as his mother, Julia Gorin, deputy director for the Adirondack Mountain Club, helps their dream house take shape in miniature. Julia says her family loves life in Saranac Lake and is excited at the prospect of cooperative housing. The greatest challenge, she says, is helping people get housing that will allow them to stay. Yeah, it's probably the single greatest challenge in the Adirondack Park is affordable housing. We can't retain residents if they don't if they can't afford to live here. We can't attract in new residents if they can't afford to live here. We can't have new families and boost the populations of our school districts if people can't afford to live here. And we have incredible opportunities. Um, we have in Saranac Lake, we have empty houses um, and the opportunity to renovate those houses and see families in, in other areas of the park. We have to be more creative in terms of how we make it possible for either more houses or more people. But those opportunities exist, and many of the biggest challenges that we face, whether we're talking about population and economics or whether we talk on the natural resources side, things like seeing our trail infrastructure built um, and improved, those are things that we could do. There's will to do it. There's funding at the state level to do it. But there aren't enough bodies on the trail crew to do it because people can't live here. Almost there. Ready? There. That's almost like building a real house. Yeah. (laughs) He's putting me to work over here. Todd Moe, North Country Public Radio at ADK Art Rise in Saranac Lake.